Income tax 2022-2023 business income part number one. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from the tax guide for small business for individuals who use Schedule C publication 334 tax year 2022 you can find on the IRS website irs.gov irs.gov look support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a youtube page we also include added resources such as excel practice problems pdf files and more like quickbooks backup files when applicable so once again click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it looking at the income tax formula we're focused on line one income remember in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement although just an outline the scaffolding other forms and schedules flowing into these line items one of those being the schedule c which is in essence an income statement in and of itself it having income minus expenses or business deductions getting to the net income which rolls into line one income of the income tax formula we see here page one of the form 1040 the schedule c rolls into the schedule one which rolls into page one of form 1040 line number eight that we see here here's an example of a schedule c profit or loss from business where we see the income statement format of the income minus the expenses that said let's focus on the income side of things now we're looking at the business income remembering the general rule for income from the irs's perspective anything you get is basically income unless the irs has an exception saying that it's not income right so when we're thinking about our business income the question is one is this income two is it exempt from us having to report it as income and if it is income where do i have to report it do i report it as business income on the schedule c or possibly somewhere else on the form 1040 or some other former schedule that said let's look at the business income introduction this chapter primarily explains business income and how to account for it on your tax return and what items are not considered income that's just as important to know what don't i have to include in there what are the exceptions and gives guidelines for selected uh, occupations clearly different occupations have their own different needs and categorizations and some specific items related to them so the, if there is a connection between any income you receive and your business the income is business income because you got it in connection to the business therefore business income so a business you'll recall in the past when we talked about if you are self-employed or not will depend in part if you're doing the activity in order to generate revenue you have a profit motive as the motive for doing the business a connection exists if it is clear that the payment of income would not have been made if you did not have the business so you can have business income even if you are not involved in the activity on a regular full-time basis so you, so you might be saying hey it's only gig work i got a little youtube income i got a little gig work platform income or whatever it's not a big deal but it's like business income even if you're not full-time i got another w-2 job you still you still need to report the income says the irs typically business income so income from work you do on the side in addition to your regular job can be business income for example you may be in the business of providing services for a ride sharing business as a second job so you you report most business income such as income from selling your products or services on schedule c that's where our focus has been the good old schedule c in essence an income statement but you report the income from the sale of business assets such as such as land and office building on other forms instead of the schedule c meaning if you had something on the books that you had to in essence capitalize 
and record the depreciation and then you sold that stuff the equipment for example you might have to report it on other forms to record the gain or loss for those particular sales as we saw in prior presentations presentation so for information on selling business assets you can see chapter three we looked at that before you got the non-employee compensation business income includes amount you receive in your business that were properly shown on form 1099 nec remember how the structure of the irs works this is an income tax system that means income is in essence bad with regards to taxes the government has an incentive to kind of get involved and look in like like pry into your business to make sure you're reporting your income they have the leverage to do that on the payer of a transaction therefore if you are in a business where you work for another business as a contractor as a sole proprietor then that business will likely be sending you not a w-2 but a 1099 most likely a 1099 nec if you do business for like an end customer you're a masseuse you're a hairstylist you work at a restaurant or something like that the customer is not going to give you a 1099 nec because you cut their hair most likely because the government can't make them do that right but they can make a business do that if you get income from another business either way you still need to report the income for from a from a legal perspective but note that if you get a 1099 nec the IRS has, of course, the 1099 NEC, and they're kind of they're looking into it in that way, as opposed to traditionally before they got more intrusive and more intrusive. They used to randomly audit people kind of thing it was a general way of keeping things in line. So this includes amounts reports on non-employee compensation in box one of the form. So you can find more information in the instructions on the back of the form 1099 NEC you receive. Therefore, on the income line, of your schedule c you would expect it to be at least equal to and most likely greater than the sum of all the forms 1099 nec you have if you put in an amount on the schedule c that's less than the sum of all 1099 nec forms it's likely the irs will will automatically kind of question that because they're like hey wait a sec i'm showing here my list of forms shows you have more income than you reported that doesn't mean that your net income after expenses is going to be the same as those 1099 NECs. And that's often where small businesses run into a problem and that they don't report their taxes, meaning the government only has the income side, the 1099 NEC, and the government will actually come after you at some point and say, hey, look, you owe us money based on top line income, not net income, because you didn't file your tax return and therefore you didn't give us the expenses. <laughs> So that's another area that could come up uh, that's to be aware of. So payment card and third party network transactions. So if you are in a business, you may receive form 1099K representing total dollar amount of total reportable uh, payment transactions. This may not be the amount you should report as income as it may not include all the receipts and it may include items that are not included in your uh, receipts such as sales tax. So the iris is also trying to get involved notice that we have these gig work economies that are coming into play which has skyrocketed the amount of like gig work small businesses that have come up which in my mind is great but the iris wants to the iris likes the structure of a, a smaller amount of big employers that have employees because they have leverage over the employers so all these small businesses that sparkled up after this uh, gig gig economy stuff isn't exactly what the iris likes right because because they they don't have not only do they not have the control control of an employer employee situation there they also don't have as much control to force people to give a 1099 because now you're working directly for the end customer not for another business so then they, they might pressure like the payment providers, the PayPal's, the credit card companies and so forth to try to get involved with issuing the 1099 situation. And so that's where you might have another kind of 1099 form, which would be reporting income. So business income deduction, income you report on schedule C may be qualified business income and, ent and entitle you to a deduction on form 1040 or 1040 SR line uh, 13 C form 8995A 
or Form 8995 to figure your deduction, if any. Okay, kinds of income. You must report on your tax return all income you receive from your business unless it, it is excluded by law. That's the general stance of the IRS. Same as normal income is the same as business income. You got income. Unless the IRS says otherwise, they want a piece of it. So in most cases, your business income will be in the form of cash, checks, credit card charges, and so on. That's the point of cash. The point of cash is to have a measure of payment so that we can receive a measure of payment. So you're usually gonna get paid in some form of cash denomination, right? But business income can be in other forms such as property or services. People often, because we use cash so much these days, think, that if I get something other than cash, I barter, I trade, it's no longer income. That's not true. You still got paid and you got to figure out what the income is, although it's less trackable, less traceable, and less easy to understand or know what the dollar amount is because you're no longer using the ruler of cash to facilitate the transaction. But you can do that. You can trade and that might work in certain situations. So these and other types of income are explained next. So caution. So if you are a U.S. citizen who has a business income from sources outside the United States, foreign income, you must report that income on your tax return unless it is exempt from tax under U.S. law. So now if you're a U.S. citizen, you have U.S. income tax responsibilities, you're, you're maybe subject to foreign tax as well in that case. And hopefully the, the, the two countries have some agreement on how they're going to deal with that in terms of who's going to be basically benefiting from the taxes that's a specialized type of situation that uh, if you're working in the tax area you could specialize in dealing with people that have income in multiple uh, countries for example so if you live outside the united states you may be able to exclude part or all of your foreign source business income for details you could see publication 54 tax guide for u.s citizens why because obviously if the income was earned elsewhere, you might be subject to the foreign country's tax rates. And if that if it wasn't the case, you'd be paying twice the tax and that wouldn't be beneficial for citizens. So bartering or property, pro bartering. You can do a barter chain. Barter chain? See, trading, in other words, for property or services. Bartering is an exchange of property or services. So I do a service for you. I you know, make a restaurant, give you meals or something, and you do a service for me, whatever it is that, that they do. And we barter, we trade, we don't use cash. Okay, so, so you still have revenue generation. Now you've got to value how much you've received for income purposes that way. So you must include in your gross receipts at the time received the fair market value of property or services you received in exchange for something else. So if you exchange services with another person and you both have agreed ahead of time on the value of the services, that value will be accepted as the fair market value unless the value can be shown to be otherwise. So clearly most of the time the service is being provided you know, you would think are your standard services that have a fair market value and you would be trading them for services of an equivalent value if you're doing a free market exchange typically. So example one, you are a self-employed lawyer. You perform legal services for a client, a small corporation. In payment for your services, you receive shares of stock in the corporation. This reminds me of that, what was it, Daredevil movie where he kept doing work for like poor people and they fade him like, and fish that the guy caught out of the and stuff any case that was just a side note let's back to the thing you're you're a lawyer in payment for your services you receive shares of stock in the corporation so you must include the fair market value of the shares in income clearly so example two you are an artist and create a work of art to compensate your landlord for the rent-free use of your apartment. All right. Dave, I need that apartment. My apartment is tiny. So you must include the fair rental value of the apartment in your gross receipts because now you were provided, you know, something. You were provided use of the apartment. So it's not like, you know, you would have been paying rent, right? So now you have to pay the value of the rent you would have. So your landlord must include the fair market value of the work of art in their rental income. So they got the work of art and they paid for it, you know, in essence, not with cash, but with 
the, the apartment. So example three, you are self-employed accountant. Both you and a house painter are members of a barter club, an organization that, that each year gives its members a directory of members and the services each member provides. Members get in touch with, each, which, uh, with other members directly and bargain for the value of the services to be formed. So to be performed. So in return for accounting services you provided for the house painter's business, the house painter painted your home. You must include in gross receipts the fair market value of the services you received from the house painter. The house painter must include the fair market value of your accounting services in their uh, gross receipts. Example four, you are a member of a barter club that uses credit unions to credit or debit members accounts for goods or services provided or received as soon as as units of as soon as units are credited to your account you can use them to buy goods or services or sell or transfer the units to other members so we've got more complex kind of bartering situations where they are in essence creating an, their own kind of cash accounting you know <laughs> system so, so you must include the value of the credit units you received in your gross receipts for the tax year in which the units are credited to your account. They basically came up with another kind of form of cash in essence, and that would be a form of valuation uh, that you would think you got paid in something that you could buy stuff with, which is kind of like cash. <laughs> so then you would think you'd have to have the, the value of the stuff that you that you got paid in would be income, you would think. So the dollar value of units received for services by an employee of the club who can use the units in the same manner as other members must be included in the employee's gross income for the tax year in which received. It, uh, it is wages subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes, FICA and FUTA taxes, and income tax withholding. So not only might... <laughs> You might also be subject to you know, the, the Medicare and Social Security. Okay, see publication 15 if you have that more complex example. Example number five, you operate a plumbing business and use the cash method of accounting. You join a barter club once again and agree to provide plumbing services to any member of the, a specified number of hours. Each member has access to a directory that lists the members of the club and the services available. Members contact each other directly and request services to be performed. You are not required to provide services unless requested by another member, but you can use as many uh, of the offered services as you wish without paying a fee. You must include the fair value of any services you receive from club members in your gross receipts when you receive them, even if you have not provided any services to the club members. All right, information. Hello, information. Information returns. If you are involved in a bartering transaction, you may have to file either of the following forms. You've got Form 1099B, Proceeds from Broker and Barter Exchange Transactions. You've got Form 1099 Miscellaneous. And you've got the, so these are the, the reporting forms for the bartering situation because you still have an income situation, similar kind of process that you would have uh, if you're paying someone, the IRS wants to pressure the payer to report the income to the person that received the income to double check that they report their income. So similar kind of process here. So for information about these forms, you can see in the general instructions for certain information returns. Real estate rents. So if you are a real estate dealer who receives income from renting real property on or on real property or an owner of a hotel, motel, etc., who provides services, maid services, etc., for guests, report the rental income and expenses on Schedule C. Notice the real estate gets a little kind of, uh, kind of confusing because you might have like rental property, which you might report on a Schedule E. And the rental property, however, uh, it might be different than if you like own a hotel, for example, because if you own a hotel, you're actively involved in the business. You're not as subject to those passive activity rules. Whereas if you have rental property, then it's, it's a Schedule E, which is quite similar to a Schedule C, in essence, another income statement related to the rental property. But uh, it's sometimes gonna have different like uh, 
passive income rules. Whereas if you're Schedule C, you're act, you have an active business that happens to deal with real estate like a hotel, then you might report it on the Schedule C because it's similar to other businesses and you don't have, you're not subject to some of those, those passive rules, which are usually negative to, to, to you for taxes. So once again, if you are a real estate dealer who receives income from renting real property or an owner of a hotel, motel, etc., who provides services like maid services, that's one of the defining characteristics here that you're actively involved in whatnot. For guests, report the rental income and expense on Schedule C rather than you know Schedule E. So if you if you are not a real estate dealer or the kind of owner described in preceding sentence report rental income and expenses on schedule e for for more information see publication 527 residential rental property real estate dealer so you are a real estate dealer if you are engaged in the business of selling real estate to customers with the purpose of making a profit from those sales Rent, uh, rent you receive from real estate held for sale to customers is subject to self-employment tax then which is a big hit on the self-employment tax however rent you receive from real estate held for speculation or investment is not subject to self-employment tax so another kind of uh, interesting or messy kind of situation here is that if we're talking about business income if it's if it's a for-profit type of active business you're likely then going to be dealing with not only as we saw in prior presentations the federal income tax but possibly getting hit with the self-employment tax which is kind of similar to payroll taxes meaning it's your self-employment social security and medicare taxes so so then whenever you're thinking is this income if it's income then you, the next question is is it subject to self-employment tax which is a big could be a big tax right on on the income or not so trailer park owner so rental income from a trailer park is subject to self-employment tax se tax if you are a self-employed trailer park owner who provides trailer lots and facilities and substantial services for the convenience of your tenants notice that if you're actively involved the idea in my interpretation is that you are now doing an active business which means that you're kind of an employee of the business and so on and therefore you would be subject to the self-employment tax which are kind of like the payroll taxes whereas if you're more of a passive uh income type of situation then you likely mo will not be subject to the self-employment tax like when you made if you when you make income like an interest income dividend income you're not subject to the self-employment tax and if you have rental property that's more passive and you're not as actively involved then and you're reporting it on the schedule c versus i mean a schedule e versus a schedule c you may not have the same kind of self-employment tax which is of course a big factor to consider if you're if you're in like the gray area between those items so you are generally considered to provide substantial services for tenants if they are primarily for the tenants convenience and are not normally provided to maintain the lots in a condition for occupancy service are substantial in the compensation for services make up a material part of the tenants rental payments so now you're actively involved because you're providing those services that's the similar kind of concept we had with the hotel that was providing cleaning and so on example of services that are not normally provided for the tenant's convenience include supervising and maintaining a recreational hall provided by the park distributing a monthly newsletter to tenants operating a laundry facility and helping tenants buy or sell their trailers so examples of services that are normally provided to maintain the lots in a condition for tenant occupancy include city sewage electrical connections and roadways hotels bordering houses uh, bordering houses and apartments rental income you receive for the use or occupancy of hotels bordering houses or apartment houses is subject to se self-employment tax if you provide services for the occupants generally you are considered to provide services for the occupants if the services are primarily for their convenience and are not services normally provided with the rental of rooms for occupancy only so now once again you've got 
the bordering houses kind of situation. And the question is, are you really kind of actively involved or not? Or is part of the benefit that you are providing going to be these services, which means you're actively involved, more likely to be subject then to self-employment tax. So an example of a service that is not normally provided for the convenience of the occupants is maid services. Back to the maid services as we saw with a hotel. However, providing heat and light, cleaning uh, stair uh, stairways and lobbies, and collecting trash are services normally provided for the occupant's convenience. Uh, prepaid rent. Advanced payments received under a lease that does not put any restriction on their use or in enjoyment uh, or income in the year you receive them. So we have another situation where we talked about before the accounting method, accrual method, cash method. Even if you're on an accrual method, sometimes when you have prepayments, the IRS would like to deviate from that. So the, so they could have, you, you could do the services in the future, but they gave you the money in advance. The government saying, hey, you've already got the money, even though you haven't done anything for it yet, you haven't earned it from an accrual standpoint, we want our piece of it, right? You have it on hand, we'd like our piece of it now, kind of thing. So this is generally true, uh, no matter what accounting method or period you use, accrual versus cash. So lease bonus. Obviously, if it was a cash method you're using, then you would have recorded the income at that point anyways. If it was an accrual method, you wouldn't have recorded the income until you earned it, but the government wants their money anyways. Lease bonus. A bonus you receive from a lease for granting a lease in uh, is an addition to the rent. Include it in your gross receipts in the year received. You've got the lease cancellation payments. Report payments you receive from your leasee for canceling a lease in your gross receipts in the year received. Then you've got the payments to third parties. If your leasee makes payments to someone else under an agreement to pay your debts or obligations, include the payments in your gross receipts when the leasee makes the payments. In other words, they didn't pay you, they paid a third party on your behalf paying off your debts as the landlord that would be similar to them paying you and then you paid off your own debts, so it's still income. So a common example of this kind of income is a leasee's payment of your property taxes on leased real property. And then we got the settlement payments. Payments you receive in settlement of a leasee's obligation to restore the leased property to its original condition or income in the amount that the payments exceed the adjusted basis of the leasehold improvements destroyed, damaged, removed, or disconnected uh, by the leasee. We got the personal property rents. If you are the business of renting personal property, equipment, vehicles, form, uh, formal wear, so now you're renting tuxedos or something like that, include the rental amounts you received in your gross receipts on Schedule C. Obviously, those are not like something that you would report on a Schedule E because you're clearly going to be actively involved in those kind of things. You have to suit people up and see if they fit in the tuxedo if you're renting that kind of stuff, which means you're going to be subject to the self-employment tax and whatnot generally and reporting on Schedule C, but not subject to those passive income rules that sometimes on a Schedule E you might be subject to. Okay, prepaid rent and other payments described under real estate rents earlier can also be received for renting personal property. Similar situation with the prepayments then. If you receive any any of those payments, include them in your gross receipts as explained in that discussion. In other words, the IRS wants their money when you get the money, even if you haven't yet given the, the tuxedo or whatnot in a prepayment format. So interest and dividend income. Interest and dividends may be considered business income. So we'll, we'll continue on with that in future presentations.